Okay, here's another crappy video by David Lovins. But I like reading, so that's what I'm gonna do. This is the only time I read every day. I have to force myself to do it. I don't feel like reading anymore. But it's important to read. <laughs> Continuing on with the temple. In the week that followed, we were all very nervous, watching for the Dacia. The tension was aggravated by the disappearance of Mueller and Zimmer, who undoubtedly committed suicide as a result of the fears which had seemed to harass them, though they were not observed in the act of jumping overboard. I was rather glad to be rid of Mueller, for even as silence had unfavorably affected the crew, Everyone seemed inclined to be silent now, as though holding a secret fear. Many were ill, but none made a disturbance. Lieutenant Cleanse chaffed under the strain, and was annoyed by the merest trifles, such as a school of dolphins which gathered about the U-29 in increasing numbers, and the growing intensity of that southward current, which was not on our chart. It at length became apparent that we had missed the dossier altogether. Such failures are not uncommon, and we were more pleased than disappointed, since our return to Wilhelm Shaven was now in order. Wilhelm Shaven was now in order. At noon, June 28th, we turned northeastward, and despite some rather comical entanglements with the unusual masses of dolphins, were soon underway. The explosion in the engine room at 2 p.m. was wholly a surprise. No defect in the machinery or carelessness in the men had been noticed, yet without warning the ship was racked from end to end with a colossal shock. Lieutenant Clense hurried to the engine room, finding the fuel tank and most of the mechanism shattered, and engineers Rabe and Schneider instantly killed. Our situation had suddenly become grave indeed, for though the chemical air regenerators were intact, and though we could use the devices for raising and submerging the ship and opening the hatches, as long as compressed air and storage batteries might hold out, we were powerless to propel or guide the submarine. To seek rescue in the lifeboats would be to deliver ourselves into the hands of enemies unreasonably embittered against our great German nation, and our wireless had failed ever since the victory affair to put us in touch with a fellow U-boat of the Imperial Navy. From the hour of the accident till July 2nd, we drifted constantly to the south, almost without plans and encountering no vessel. Dolphins still encircled the U-29, a somewhat remarkable circumstance considering the distance we had covered. On the morning of July 2nd, we sighted a warship flying American colors, and the men became very restless in their desire to surrender. Finally, Lieutenant Clense had to shoot a seaman named Traba, who urged this un-German act with a special violence. This quieted the crew for a time, and we submerged unseen. The next afternoon, a dense flock of seabirds appeared from the south, and the ocean began to heave ominously. Closing our hatches, we awaited developments until we realized that we must either submerge or be swamped in the mounting waves. Our air pressure and electricity were diminishing, and we wished to avoid all unnecessary use of our slender mechanical resources. But in this case, there was no choice. We did not descend far, and when, after several hours, the sea was calmer, we decided to return to the surface. Here, however, a new trouble developed, for the ship failed to respond to our direction, in spite of all that the mechanics could do. As the men grew more frightened at this undersea imprisonment, some of them began to mutter again about Lieutenant Clenzie's ivory image, but the sight of an automatic pistol calmed them. We kept the poor devils as busy as we could, 
tinkering at the machinery even when we knew it was useless. Well, that's good for today. I gotta go.